Today we've got a crazy revenge story on somebody's own sister. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, my revenge to the ex that messed up my finances. People think marrying into the wrong family could set you back years in life. They think that their acceptance of you would determine how peaceful your home is. Well, I call it bull. What sets you back 10 years in life is marrying the absolute wrong person, especially one that would go to the lengths to bring you down to their level. This isn't a story of how I acted as a bigger person, it's one that explains the statement, if you go low, I would go lower, because that was exactly what we did. My name is Anna, I'm 37 and work in the finance industry. I don't need to bore you with the details of my work life. For someone below 40, the wrinkles on my face were a testament to how far I'd worked, how much I'd put in to get to the level I'd attained. It spoke of the determination and the sacrifice that I had to make to advance this fast. One of those sacrifices was not getting love as early as others did. My mom and other friends around me used to make jokes along the lines of me finding companionship with my work. They weren't wrong, at least not in the beginning stage. Then it got to a time when I couldn't deal with coming home to take out and no hugs. The silence grew increasingly annoying and I knew it was time to find a real companion. Someone I could share the highest success of my career with and come home to. And then along came Tyler. He swept into my life like a ray of sunshine, bringing warmth and happiness with him. With his kind words and loving gestures, Tyler made me feel like anything was possible. At first, Tyler seemed perfect. He was attentive and affectionate, always there to support me when I needed him. We laughed together, shared our dreams, and talked endlessly about how we would build a life filled with love and happiness. I thought I'd found my soulmate. There was no way I could have known that beneath the charade of love, respect, and happiness I felt with Tyler was a whole box of canker worms preparing to unleash themselves into my world. From the moment Tyler entered my life, there was this sense of joy and excitement that he brought that I'd never known before. His infectious laughter and warm smile lit up every room, and I found myself drawn to him like a moth to a flame. It wasn't long before we were inseparable, spending every waking moment together and dreaming of the life we would build together. As our relationship blossomed, so too did our trust in each other. I guess one of the things that quickly advanced our relationship was the fact that Tyler was always there for me, offering a listening ear and a shoulder to lean on whenever I needed it. I trusted him implicitly, believing wholeheartedly in the sincerity of his love and the strength of our bond. It was during this time that Tyler began to take a more active interest in my finances. At first it seemed innocent enough, just a curious partner wanting to understand more about my financial situation. I welcomed his involvement, seeing it as a sign of his commitment to our future together. We had started living together before we were legally married, so it was just the next stage for us. It was no big deal. So slowly, Tyler began to access my financial information. He knew of the sources of income I had and the range of my monthly and annual pay. He would ask to see my bank statements, offering to help me manage my finances more effectively. At the time, I saw it as a gesture of mutual trust, a sign that we were building a life together based on openness and honesty. To be honest, at the time, no warning bills were resounding that I refused to listen to. It didn't sound odd in any way since he was willing to share the same information about his finances with me. I just wasn't as interested as I should have been. I would be lying if I said I didn't notice anything that seemed off till it all went to dust. There were moments when I saw certain cracks, but the problem was that I was scared to address them at that instant, cause I didn't want any form of argument between Tyler and I. Stupid move, yeah, I know that now. It started with small things, unexplained purchases that appeared on my bank statements, and unfamiliar charges that I couldn't account for. At first, I brushed them off as simple mistakes, convinced that there must be a logical explanation for them. Tyler was always quick to offer excuses, assuring me that there was nothing to worry about and that he would take care of it. However, as time went on, the discrepancies in my bank statements became more frequent and more pronounced. Yet I continued to turn a blind eye, unwilling to believe that Tyler could be capable of deception. After all, he was the love of my life, my confidant, my rock. How could I doubt him? Right. The signs were there, looking at me with naked eyes, yet in my naivety, I chose to believe in the illusion of our perfect love, refusing to acknowledge the truth staring me in the face. But by the time I was finally ready to open my eyes to the truth, it was too late. Too many things had been destroyed. What finally ticked me off? It started innocently enough. 
with a misplaced folder tucked away in the depths of our shared filing cabinet. Tyler was out for one of his numerous camping trips that never seemed to agree with me. I had searched for hours before I finally found it inside the cabinet almost slipping into the open space at the back. As I scanned through its contents, my heart sank at the sight of hidden bank statements, accounts I never knew existed and transactions I never knew occurred. It didn't seem as much, but it was the final alarm bell I needed to hear to make me realize and accept that some things were not right. It made me look into the activities that I didn't remember doing more, and as I did, I discovered more and more things. There had been a consistent move of money in small quantities to a particular account. I had no memory of any conversation that said he could do that, and I didn't expect him to do something like that without informing me. It all seemed weird, but it wasn't just about the money. I realized that Tyler had been lying about other things too. He would say one thing but do another, and sometimes he would even try to make me doubt myself. It felt like he was trying to control me. He would say the money was for a particular thing, but the records I was staring at said they went for something else. It helped that he wasn't home that weekend. It gave me a lot of time to myself. I called in sick at work and went full investigator mode. Even though it was hard, I started to gather evidence of what Tyler had done. I found Bing statements and other documents that showed exactly how much money he had taken from me. It was a lot more than I'd ever imagined. The record I was making made it evident that Tyler had been lying to me for a long time and it made me feel sick to my stomach. I had to make it end. It took a while for me to finally realize what was going on but now that I had, I could not sit still knowing that someone was siphoning my money to his personal biddings and lying to my face about it. And no, this wasn't a case of me refusing to share the money I earned. For what it's worth, I earned way more than he did as a high school teacher and that never bothered me. Not for once did I have an issue with him knowing the details of my account, or helping me with my finances. What I had issues with was him stealing from me. It was stealing, and I knew I had to find a way to end it and get my pound of flesh back, but I was in a dilemma. I couldn't report the case as financial crimes because I had willfully consented to him making use of my account, handling the finances, and running it for our joint use. There was no way I would be able to successfully plead my case that he had stolen from me. Legal means were not going to work. I had to get my revenge by my own hands. So I sat down and meticulously planned my revenge, focusing on hitting Tyler where it hurt the most, his finances. Both the ones he earned from work and the one he had taken from me without informing me first. The first step in my plan for revenge was to cut off all financial ties between us. I started by closing our shared accounts and revoking Tyler's access to my money. It was a difficult decision, but I knew it was necessary to protect myself and reclaim control of my finances. I made it seem as if it was extremely necessary for me to do. I could not have him figuring out what I was doing before he had a chance to pay him back in his own coin. Next, I took proactive steps to ensure that Tyler no longer had any means of accessing my money. I changed passwords, updated security settings, and monitored my accounts closely to prevent any unauthorized transactions. To distance myself from the financial activities that joined Tyler to my bank, I pretended that my bank was experiencing issues and couldn't process certain transactions. I made excuses for not being able to cover shared expenses, forcing Tyler to start paying for things out of his own pocket. I strategically splurged on luxury items and experiences, knowing that Tyler would feel the financial strain of trying to keep up with my lifestyle. Each purchase was carefully planned to maximize its impact on Tyler's finances while minimizing any suspicion of my intentions. For an entire month, I maintained this facade, carefully orchestrating situations where Tyler had to bear the financial burden. It wasn't easy but I was determined to make him feel the consequences of his actions. I was over and done with his dishonesty and manipulative personality. The good thing was that he couldn't complain. As I watched him struggle to keep up with the financial burden I'd placed on him, I felt a sense of satisfaction knowing that my plan was working. It was a subtle yet effective way to make him pay for his betrayal, without resorting to direct confrontation, but in the end he found out what I was up to. In the weeks that followed, Tyler's suspicion grew after he stumbled upon the record I'd made the weekend I found out about his unexpected expenses and transfers that I thought I kept hidden away. He tried to confront me about it, but he couldn't do it directly. 
Of course, I feigned ignorance, refusing to acknowledge the truth. He let it end there, but then the silence grew. Everything I thought I knew about Tyler that made him the right person for me suddenly wasn't there. I wasn't surprised because I saw that coming. I said nothing till he was finally ready to walk away. When he suggested going apart that night, I laughed to his surprise and he was gone before the end of the week. I was heartbroken, but it was nice to know that I made him broke before we separated. I'm kind of curious what the general consensus in a situation like this is. If you're moving in with a partner and you're sharing living expenses with them, should it be expected that they have a good understanding of what your finances actually are? Or is it just more fair for them to know just basically how much you roughly make and then work around that? I mean, it definitely seems like maybe they were skipping some steps to have the ex just have so much access to their finances, I guess under the guise of trying to help with it. That said, our next story is, Class Bully ruins my architectural model and I make sure he fails the test. I am a very firm believer in paying people back in their own coin. Whether or not they find out I did this is entirely their business. I wasn't always this way until I snapped from the constant bullying. Everywhere you go, you see so many people say, do not reply hate with hate, reply with kindness. And I'm just glad that they didn't use the term bullying because I would have felt a little bad. A lot of apologizing is done on behalf of bullies with phrases like, maybe they're going through a lot as well and have no outlet. I am nobody's aggression outlet and if you bully me, I'll retaliate in my way. You might be thinking, those are heavy words for an 18 year old. Truth is, you probably agree with me when you're done reading. Everyone knew Terrence to be a bully and everyone also knew he liked to pick on me, Kevin, every single chance he got. It took a long time before I finally got to this stage and a little recounting is very needed. I was never the most liked kid in any of my classes. I think I'm one of those people that you call a teacher's pet. I thought it was okay to always have the answers to all the questions the teachers asked and to remind them about tests and assignments. Both my parents are educators and being a smart kid was inevitable. I loved school so much that I always wanted to be in school. I didn't realize it wasn't the same for everyone for a long time. It didn't help that my teachers liked students eager to learn more. Eventually the nickname Teacher's Pet clung to me so tightly that most people forgot that I was Kevin. At least I wasn't bullied for my love for school until Terrence came along. Terrence transferred to my school when I was in the 8th grade. His dad had retired from the army and was working in a local establishment for veterans, so Terrence had to switch schools. I thought joining a new school made you feel out of place and chill. Not Terrence. He immediately made an impression on the jocks in the school with his football skills. That was as much of a big deal as being a star student in my school. I had no problem with Terrence's outgoing personality until I became the recipient of his bad habits. The first sign that Terrence had the personality of a bully was when he threw a piece of chalk at the teacher and blamed one of the smaller children in the class. I was expecting the boy to talk and say it was Terrence who did it, but he didn't. The class laughed it off. That made me uncomfortable and I talked to the boy after the class. I asked him why he didn't say anything. Terrence lived on his block and was very mean. He told me that Terrence would make him do his homework. That was unsettling and I told the teacher what my classmate had told me. The teacher called Terrence and my other classmate to ask if this was true. To my surprise, the boy denied anything of the sort. Little did I know that what I did would cause me so much trouble throughout my high school years. Terrence turned his focus to me. I was never a victim of what he made me go through before then. My introduction was Terrence telling me to complete his math assignment for him. Naive me thought he needed my help in figuring out the equations. Boy was I wrong. He laughed in my face, pulled me by the shirt, and told me to write the answers down or he would beat me up. I was scared so I quickly did it. Even though I wasn't small, Terrence is a pretty big kid and I didn't want anybody messing up my face. By the 10th grade, everyone but the teacher knew that I was Terrence's favorite thing to pick on. He did everything from knocking my food down to throwing my books into the dumpster. It didn't stop there. Terrence realized I wasn't going to say anything to the teacher as long as he kept the threat of hurting me. And I believed it too because I'd seen him do it. Eventually, he began to cheat off me for tests and exams. It just so happened that Terrence always managed to be near me during these assignments. I hated that someone was profiting off of my hard work, but I didn't want to get hit. So I kept quiet and said nothing. 
I went with it because as long as he didn't interfere with my schoolwork to a large extent, I was fine. And it wasn't much of a disturbance since I'm extremely smart. Until he brought me into what I call my villain era. Excuse the cringe. By the end of the 11th grade, I considered Terrence's bullying a habit. I didn't think much about it anymore. We came back to school after the summer and you could feel everyone's in need to do even better. You want to pass your tests better and get your GP up before the SATs. Whatever way we had to do that was each person's business. Some planned to do it by reading more than before and others aimed for extra credit. And Terrence, he planned to cheat off me as always. During the first two tests, he managed to sit around me and cheat off me. I knew I was wrong for giving him my answer sheets, but again, I was scared. We were supposed to turn in an architectural model of what our dream home would look like four weeks after it was assigned. I immediately got to work, making a model that showed everything from the way the plumbing system was going to work to how I wanted the garage to be designed. I was incredibly proud of the model and I was ready to turn it in. But when I got to school that morning, Terrence was waiting for me in front of the bathroom. I wondered why he dragged me by the shirt when I'd given him all the assignments he'd made me do until he asked me for his architectural model. I didn't get him until I realized he had expected me to do his model for him. I told him I did no such thing and Terrence retaliated by smashing my model. I didn't know that I'd started screaming and trying to hit Terrence until the janitor forced us apart. He warned me to stop trying to hit people and I saw Terrence look at me with a smirk. It was right there that I knew that I had to retaliate. Luckily for me, being the teacher's pet helped me get back at Terrence. I went to my teacher, Mr. Morris, and told him everything that had happened. He asked for proof and I asked him to compare Terrence's scores with mine. I told him that Terrence had been cheating off of me in the tests. Mr. Morris was disappointed I let him cheat off of me and said I could be reported for malpractice. I told him I didn't have a choice because Terrence had threatened me. He asked me what I wanted to do and I told him I wanted Terrence to be caught red-handed because he knew how to charm his way out of anything. Mr. Morris told me to bring my ruined architectural model. He looked at it and asked me to fix it. He gave me a week and I couldn't be more grateful. It made up 30% of my grades for the subject and I couldn't afford to fail. My chance to get back at Terrence finally came two weeks later when we had our history test. Mr. Morris had a habit of announcing tests three days before they were held. After he announced the test, I went up to him and asked for a favor. I asked if it was okay to share my plan for catching Terrence in the act. I asked if he could print a different test script for me. Every other student including Terrence was going to get the same script except me. He agreed to this and I knew my plan couldn't fail because Terrence always cheated off of me. You might be asking him why I didn't do it a different way, but I didn't need Terrence knowing that I was the reason for his failure. I still didn't want to get hit. On the day of the test, Mr. Morris went along with my plan and arranged the class so that Terrence was sitting beside me. As always, Terrence cheated off of me, directly from my answer sheet without bothering to look at his questions. My question sheet was intentionally kept under my answer sheet on purpose from time to time so Terrence didn't see the questions. Not that he cared about the questions anyway. We submitted the answers at the end of the test, and after school hours, Terrence bumped into me and told me he looked forward to cheating off me again. I didn't react because I knew there was going to be no next time. Mr. Morris handled what happened after perfectly. He made sure that I wasn't mentioned as a part of the plan. He called Terrence's dad to see him in the principal's office to inform him that Terrence was cheating. Before Terrence was called to the office, Mr. Morris informed his dad that he'd been suspecting Terrence of cheating during his tests. He claimed that he had narrowed it down because of the classes I didn't take with Terrence. He failed them. Then he told them how he'd given me different test questions from the rest of the class, and Terrence's answer sheet had the same boxes ticked as mine, even though we had completely different questions. According to Mr. Morris, Terrence denied ever doing this until Mr. Morris told him he had proof. Terrence was scared of his dad for reasons I don't care enough to mention, so he immediately admitted to cheating off me. He claimed he did so because his dad didn't pressure him about good results or being a good kid. Apparently, the reason Terrence moved with his dad and didn't remain with his mother where they lived previously was because he'd gotten expelled for bullying and injuring another kid in his former school. Terrence was suspended for five weeks and was required to take all the tests he cheated off me for. 
and the assignments he made me do. He was also removed from the football team and was banned from even practice. I got suspended for a week as well for not saying anything or reporting him for cheating off me or doing his assignments. I knew it wasn't the right thing to do, but I couldn't bring myself to do it for fear of getting hit. I saw Terrence after he was back from suspension, and you could tell he wasn't going to be giving me any more trouble from then on. I was safe from him getting back at me for devising the plan to catch him because he didn't know that I did that. The information Mr. Morris had given was that I didn't know that he'd given me different test questions. Yes, I managed to get back at my bully without ever showing my face to him or letting him know that I had a hand to play in anything that happened. For future tests and exams, Mr. Morris made sure that I was seated nowhere near Terrence so he wouldn't be tempted to do the same thing. I believe it was the best way to handle the situation. Many of you might believe that what Terrence got in return was extreme, but I'm very satisfied with the result. When it comes to bullies, do not repay their rudeness and the ability to make life difficult with kindness. No, you pay them back in their own coin. So personally, I don't even think this is extreme. If anything, it's a really light form of payback. The main problem here with OP not being implicated is they can't reveal that they've been getting bullied and threatened the whole time too. So for Terrence to just have to go and try to take those tests all over again and that's about it? Sure, his grades are all going to tank because he didn't learn it, but it's not like this kid is going to get straight up suspended or kicked out of school because it was revealed he was bullying and threatening a kid the whole time. Our next story is, my sister was my rival. I'm the second child in a family of four, let's call my name G. I have a sister, let's call her K. Our parents were lovebirds who were so intentional about us, their kids. I mean, our home was a site filled with love, warmth, and enough visibility to go around for everyone. But we only had one problem, which was how our parents compared me with my sister and my sister with me academically. It was crazy. But no one realized how terrible the situation was until my sister began to resent me. My sister felt it was unfair that my parents consistently praised me for my academic prowess, while she was viewed as less. At first, no one noticed that she was trying so much to cause a problem where there was none. You know, as much as I wasn't comfortable that my sister saw me as a competition, I tried so much to give her grace and make excuses for her on different occasions. She was the only sibling I had and we had so many fond memories together. We shared the same room when we were younger. I remember her creativity and how she would decorate the walls of our room with exquisite paintings that would make my heart swell. She would give me a painting of myself on my birthdays and she did that every year until I was 12. I had several paintings of me to last for a lifetime thanks to my sister. I remember how my friends would look at us and how they would usually let out a smirk, wondering how we were raised with such a beautiful bond. I can see that those were the best years of my life, right before everything began to fall apart, when I was 13 and she was 15. I think we no longer saw each other as kids. Instead, she started to see me as a rival. I remember it all starting with the recognition I got it back in high school. I was awarded the best student in my class with a huge cash prize and other benefits. Everyone was proud of me and I trusted my parents to make a huge fuss about such things. They literally told everyone around me that no one could beat me in academics. And I remember my mother saying that I took after her in that regard. And then my dad said I obviously took after him. All I did was stand and smile wide at them as they bantered with each other. But in that moment, no one took notice of my sister. I don't know how to describe it, but it was as though she wasn't present. I had to remind my parents that my sister made it to the top 10 in her class too, which to me was a very big feat considering the geniuses in her class. It was then that my dad gave her a long hug and my mom said she'd been blessed by God with brainy children. But I noticed that things were no longer the same after that. My sister practically withdrew from me and she used every opportunity to remind me that not everything in life was hinged around academic prowess and at such moments I would look lost and blink. I felt that because the circumstances most times wouldn't revolve around academics or whatever she meant. I remember when I tried to give my suggestion regarding a task we were given by our parents, and Kay made sure to dispel every idea I brought regarding the task. She made it look like we were in a competition with each other, and it was a sad sight for me. I tried to make things cool between us again. I mean, she was the only person I had in the whole world. But I guess my sister was bent on being the villain in our story. 
You know, I could also come across as a competition to a host of other students in the school, maybe because I don't stop until I realize my goals. I was a strong contender in my class, and I made it clear that I wasn't going to back down. It was a fierce competition, but I emerged as the best, which I had no reason to be apologetic about or whatever they thought I would do. But the problem wasn't with the students who felt my guts irritated them. The problem was my sister who joined them to plot against me. One time I got almost suspended from school because I didn't want to give in to bullies who felt they could harass me. Again, I got into a very heated argument with a student who tried to take my place unjustly at the confectioner's shop. Even when it was clear that I was the next person in the queue, the student behind me tried to bully me out of the queue with the insistence that I take her place. It was funny to me because of the way she sounded like a joke throughout the whole process. Well, I made my intention clear that I would not be bullied in such a way, and in a twinkling of an eye, this student came for me with full force. I narrowly escaped a punch on my face and before I could get a better grasp of what was happening, I was already on the floor and this student was on me dishing out punches on my face and chest. I tried to break free but the student seemed to have come prepared. I turned to avoid the last punch that eventually knocked me off and I saw that my sister was walking away from the scene. I remember swinging my hand in the air and trying to call her name. That was the last thing I remembered. The next time I opened my eyes, I was in the hospital with my parents holding and squeezing my hands with so much love. I tried to move and I realized I couldn't move any part of my body as the pain I felt was so excruciating. My mother signaled to me to relax because she saw how much I struggled. My mother cried and my father cursed under his breath and I could bet that he was saying you would make sure that he taught the student that did that to me a lesson to last a lifetime. My father continued to mutter indistinct words as he squeezed my hands. My sister wasn't there and I didn't ask why she wasn't. I knew my parents didn't understand what went on between their kids and I used to wonder why they didn't. During the period when I recovered, I got news that the student who did that to me had been expelled and it took lots of pleas for my mother before my father backed down from his intention to have her arrested. When I recovered, I didn't return to that school. It was a hard decision at the time, but it was better to be safe than sorry. On my last day at school, I remember shedding a tear or two. I loved my school and I'd built so many memories around the walls of the Citadel, especially between my sister and me. Even though I left, my sister didn't leave. My sister was asked to continue as she was rounding off, although she didn't see the sense in my parents' decisions to change my school. As a matter of fact, she felt my parents were overreacting, and my mother couldn't help but make a huge backlash at her. She was disappointed that she watched on as someone tried to rip life out of me. But my sister's response was that I wasn't a baby anymore, and she was in no way obligated to babysit me at school. I think that was enough to show my parents that something wasn't right between us. But I was surprised that they chose to ignore the subtle signs from my sister. In those moments, things grew worse between my sister and me. She couldn't hide the fact that she detested the actions my parents took when they changed my school. She kept saying they had a favorite child in our home and that that favorite child wasn't her in any way. She reminded everyone who cared to listen that she was once bullied in school, but my parents didn't change her school. At that point, I didn't know what was more disgusting, that she chose to be unreasonable, or that she displayed her foolery publicly for everyone to see. Fast forward to a few years later, Kay graduated high school, and she tried to get into an Ivy League, but she didn't make it. She got into a good school, but she kept mentioning that an Ivy League school was her dream. On my own part, I finished high school and got admitted into an Ivy League in no time. To be honest, I didn't fancy the idea of going to an Ivy League, but my parents insisted that my sister and I should try to get in. Well, if that was going to make my parents happy, I decided to give it a try. After I got accepted, my sister was obviously not happy that I was able to get in, while she wasn't able to do so. To be honest, I wish we could switch roles, since I saw that she wanted a spot in an Ivy League so badly. Meanwhile, everyone, including my parents, showered her with so much love and affection. I could see that they tried their best to make her see that even though they wanted an Ivy League for us, the most important thing for them was to be able to give us a college education conveniently. But I guess none of those words of affirmation meant much to my sister, and no one knew the plans she had for me. 
Meanwhile, she tried to play the good girl role around me, which looked so strange and out of character. She suddenly became a brand new person around me. I could tell that she was trying so hard to bring us together again. Innocently, I'd believed her when she apologized to me about all the times she was hostile and how much she had tried to wedge us apart. Of course, in my simplicity and the quest to promote family values, I believed her. But I noticed that she was always trying to get around me whenever I used my computer, and she also spent so much time with me, probably because we had enough time at the time. Then one day, I got an email notification from my school that they would like me to reconsider my decision to cancel my space for the upcoming school entry, as they couldn't help but have me as their student. Well, thanks to my academic and social abilities, I stared at the email for a long time, and I knew that someone had been prying into my business. I knew that I could hold my sister accountable because of how much she had come around me in those times. I tried to hold back my tears, but my emotions betrayed me. For my sister, I would always be seen as a competition. And worst of all, a competition that deserved to be hunted down. I knew deeply that I would get back at her, and maybe in a way that would hurt her for a longer time. My time came when my parents hosted a few family friends to a dinner to send off their first daughter as she went off to college. That was because my sister was scheduled to resume in the winter and me in the fall. Everyone took turns to say great things about her, and I mean so many efforts were made by my parents to shower her with love and encomiums. When it got to my turn, I started my speech well, but I ended it with a betrayal from my sister. I could see the shock on everyone's face as they turned to give Kay a cold stare, which I think she would remember for the rest of her life. While it's usually not the best thing to go around airing out your personal beefs with other people, I think it's completely fair in a situation where you're almost expected to kind of build up and give praise to somebody that you reveal that you have a very important personal issue going on that is going to probably forever prevent you from doing so. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.